Welcome back to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal. I'm very pleased to have as our guest today Charles Murray, whom I consider to be America's leading living social scientist. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Bill. I don't know if that is that praise. <laughs> uh, it's, I'm, I'm dazzled, uh, coming from you especially. Maybe damning with faint praise, given what some of your social science uh, colleagues do, but no, it, it is genuine praise. <laughs> Mets is genuine praise for me. So I think people would be interested to know, how did you become a social scientist? You know, it's one of those funny things that you can remember about when you were a kid. I can remember reading the Reader's Digest when maybe I was 12 or 13 years old and seeing a, an article about the Rand Corporation. And I swear I read that and I said, that's the kind of place I'd like to work. I'd never heard of a place like that. Um, that sort of indicates to me that there was some deep proclivity toward this yeah. kind of work. The, the more direct answer to that question is I was over in Thailand. Uh, with the Peace Corps. This was 1965 to 67, right after college. And my uh, wife at that time had been a Fulbright scholar. She was Thai. She had to stay in the country to uh, work off her teaching obligation. And so I had to stay in the country and find some work. And I ended up getting uh, work in uh, a study of northeastern villages. And it was part of the Hearts and Minds kind of effort that the U.S. military was having at that time. And I did that work and I wrote that report and in the course of that I started to learn about regression analysis and I said this is really cool. I was I was hooked. Uh, from then on I never thought of doing anything else. But And you went on to get a PhD in? I went back to MIT uh, for a PhD and my explicit purpose was I wanted to learn every quantitative method known to man so I could augment my toolkit. But somehow, I've, I think I've read most of your books, and th there's plenty of data in them, but I wouldn't say you're a big user of super fancy quantitative methods, regression analyses, et cetera. Yeah, you need to know what they're good for and not good for. And, uh, well, here, here's my, my take on them. If you have an important relationship that you have observed in life about the effects of marriage or the effects of uh, unemployment or whatever, and you want to see if that insight is correct, quantitative methods are really helpful uh, to check out whether you're just making it up or whether the, the evidence is really there. What you should not do is run regression equations, see a statistically significant coefficient, and then from that try to infer that something important is going on. As far as I'm concerned, quantitative analysis primarily validates or fails to validate insights that are more obvious than quantitative uh, uh, statistical tidbits. And you've written, I think, about your experience in Thailand and the insights, the non-quantitative non yeah. insights you got from that, which I think changed your point of view on things, no? Uh, essentially, um, <laughs> most of what you read in my books I learned in Thai villages. Uh, I'll, I'll elaborate a little no, bit please. on that. Yeah, it was yeah. because uh, it was, it, it's, it's fascinating to me anyway. I'm up there in these Thai villages and I'm trying to analyze uh, of whether government assistance has improved the life of the villagers and whether they like that stuff or not. And um, initially, when we're talking to them, this is anthropological quasi-participant research, a lot of times they can't even remember that there was a well project or a double cropping project or a fish farm project. And then when you finally remind them of it, they say, oh, yeah, well, the crops failed, you know, so we, we didn't do that anymore. Or they put the well in a place where we told them that it was going to be bad water if they put it there, but they put it there anyway. Instead, when you got them talking around the, the fire at night, it turned out that there are two things they really wanted from the Thai government. First, they wanted the Thai government to catch water buffalo thieves because that's a big deal to lose a water buffalo. Uh, and secondly, they wanted the Thai government to allow them to make home, uh, moonshine for personal consumption. <laughs> they were very reasonable about this. They said, uh, you know, not to sell, just they ought to let us make enough to drink. And I suddenly was struck first by the enormous discrepancy between what Bangkok thought was important to the villagers and what the villagers wanted out of government. And the second thing I got out of it was that when the government change agent, agent showed up, uh, the village went to hell in terms of its, of its internal governance. And when you saw villages where you did not have 
uh, change agents, you had some very sophisticated self-governmental mechanisms that they had developed naturally. All of those things, when I came back to look at social programs in the United States, kept me ri reminding me that, gee, this uh, inner city Detroit attempt to help delinquents is running into the same problems that they ran into when they tried to introduce double cropping in the Thai village. So were you a skeptic about sort of do-gooding big government efforts? That was part Pretty of Pretty close it. to the beginning. That, like that, was, that was part of it. And another part, I was really impressed by the degree to which human beings left alone to organize themselves did a pretty good job of it. Well, let's, those are two good themes to follow up on. Yeah. I mean, your first, I guess, famous book, maybe your first book, I don't know, was Losing Ground. That was the first famous one. The first famous one. Yeah. Um, in 1984, and that, I'd say, people at least took to be more on the first side of the, the first of your two hypotheses, the sort of damage government can do. Yes. How did you, and this is on, on, it was on welfare primarily, though not, not only. Um, I don't know, I'm just it curious. It was actually you... much broader than just welfare, yeah. and that's one of the things. People talk about Losing Ground as being a book about welfare. Well, that's partly because but, you helped inspire the welfare reform yeah. efforts later, and so people think, you know, but, yeah. Actually, it deals also with crime and right. with education and with job training and a variety of other things, but the common underlying theme was that during the 1960s, we changed the rules of the game, and we changed them specifically for poor people, and even more specifically for young poor people, and most specifically of all for black poor young people. And what a lot of these things did, which were well meant, was they made it profitable for people to behave in destructive ways in the short term. Uh, excuse me, profitable for the new things that were destructive in the long term, but look good in the short term. And, and what led you to the, I mean, you obviously have a ton of data in the book on a ton of different issues, but was yeah. there one thinker who influenced you the most, one uh, experience, one study? I'm just curious, or had you just an accumulation of work I, you had been I had doing been, during the 70s? I mean, I had been uh, evaluating social programs on contract to the U.S. government throughout the 70s for an organization called the American Institutes for Research. So we got a contract, we go out and we evaluate such and such program right up to the evaluation report. One of those involved um, chronic delinquents in South Side Chicago, which are really chronic delinquents. And uh, it was a program to provide non-custodial alternatives. Don't lock them up, give them residential facilities that are less restrictive and so forth. And in the course of that, I remember specifically one uh, 16, 17-year-old who was really irritated that he had been finally thrown into reform school. And he was irritated because he said, they picked me up for lots worse things than that before, and they'd never sent me here. Why do they send me here now? And as I listened to him, he was looking at a system which, from his perspective, was completely irrational. They'd let, they'd let him get away with all sorts of things for arrest after arrest, and he was finally being punished, and the whole thing made no sense. And, yeah, that example stuck in my mind. And the same thing happened with all kinds of other programs where, from the point of view of the recipient, um, it made a lot of sense to do things that were going to kill your future. So people were behaving rationally. In the short term. In the short term. Yeah. And w I'm just curious. I remember reading Ed Banfield's book. You, you knew Ed oh, yeah, later in Heavenly life. Oh, yeah, Heavenly City. And then Heavenly City, which was, what, 1970, I think? 75. Was 74. That, yeah. Which goes on at some, you know, which is, it stresses the difference between short term and long term. But I don't know. If Ed Banfield's book was a brilliant exposition of a lot of the same kinds of things I was saying in Losing Ground. He was prematurely right. Uh, in 1974, uh, people weren't wanting to pay that much attention to it. Then in 1975, James Wilson, James Q. Wilson, comes along with thinking about crime, and that does sort of break the logjam. You think that? That's interesting. I never really thought about what. What was the moment when it became respectable to say these poli the incentives and all these great many of these great society programs were were skewed well, and, and uh, self self defeating really? I mean, I, I think uh, Jim Wilson's book was a major uh, event there, Be and and actually it wasn't just the book's publication. He had a an excerpt from it in the New York Times magazine, and the title of the uh, article was "Lock 'Em Up." And that was such a stunning thing to read in 1975 
and it occurred at a time when so many people living in urban areas understood just how bad the pri crime problem was that at that got a response. And all at once, I think, a lot of the things that were going on in the liberal reform efforts came under a new kind of scrutiny. And I guess written by a Harvard professor, so they... Yeah, but written by uh, one of the greatest uh, crafters of social science prose who's ever lived. Yeah. Wrote beautifully. How important was, since you mentioned it, I was gonna, I'll come back to ask you about mm -hmm. losing ground and the reception to that, which was not uncontroversial. Even though you're, you're pretending that the ground had been laid for nine years before you did that book, but what about prose? I mean, let's talk, you're, you're a very good writer and a compelling writer, I believe. Um, I don't know, how important is it's it? It's huge. It's hugely important. Well, the, the, another of the finest social science writers who ever lived was named Irving Kristol. And, and the, it's so important because, look, the kinds of issues you're talking about with public policy uh, are ones in which you have to use persuasion combined with evidence that people will actually read. Uh, so a James Q. Wilson, in thinking about crime, conducted absolutely no original analyses of his own. He took the entire literature, this technical literature that was very abstruse, and he made it accessible through his brilliant prose to a large audience. And it had an impact, whereas all those separate articles had not. And I think that if you go to all the books that have had, uh, as they say, changed the conversation, uh, they have had that in common. It seems to me that Jim Wilson and you actually both um, didn't beat people's heads in with your conclusions. I mean, you sort of let, I think you're good at this. You lead people to, you, you often say up front, I have a certain set of views that yeah. you may or may not agree with, but I'm going to lead, you know, but you sort of lead people to think them through themselves. I think that's very important. I, this has been something that I started with losing ground, and uh, I think I pretty much repeated it with every book where I structure the book saying, look, I'm going to give you a lot of data. And uh, at the end, I'm also going to give you my interpretation of what those data mean. But I have a particular set of, uh, of predilections and philosophical uh, leanings that you ought to know about. I think that that ought to be standard operating procedure for all social scientists. So that when uh, Christopher Jenks writes a book he starts out by saying, I'm a social democrat. I'm going to give you a really fair reading of the data on inequality or whatever I'm writing about, and then I'm going to give you my policy an analysis of that, but you should understand where I'm coming from. I will say, it, even though it sounds self-serving, that um, whereas I do that, I know of virtually no social scientist on the left who starts out by saying, by the way, I'm a social democrat. Yeah, no. well, everyone they know is, so they don't feel they have to say <laughs> yeah. it, you know, yeah. I guess. But it was, despite your um, good prose and a certain, and a, and a genuine, I think, willingness to let people draw what conclusions they wished, uh, the book was met in 84 with a certain amount, of, and it generated a certain amount of controversy, I remember. Oh, it felt to me like a red-hot controversy until... I found out what red-hot controversy was really like with the bell curve. Right. But well, yeah, in 1984, uh, it, it, it got a lot of people. It was a two-stage process, Bill. Yeah, tell me. I'm first, first uh, the book came out. You got a couple of people like Robert Samuelson wrote a column on it, a few other visible people. Where were you? You were uh, like a scholar Institute. at the Manhattan Institute. Yeah. So it was viewed as center-right, I guess. and uh, Libertarian right, Libertarian right, actually, yeah. yeah. In New York, right. Yeah. And, uh, and you weren't that well-known. I was completely uh, obscure. I mean, you weren't nobody, James nobody Q. Wilson. Never heard you yeah, weren't James yeah. Q. Wilson or Christopher Jones. Yeah, I was, right. uh, uh, I was a nobody. How does a book, this is, people be curious, in looking back, how did it take them? Was there some moment that caused it to take off, or was it just general, or you published it? And I think it was the review by uh, Nick Lemon in uh, The New Republic. Hmm. Because Nick Lemon... I, I think I'm quoting fairly directly, said there is a horrible authenticity about my description of the problem. And for the New Republic audience, this was a very important thing to say, uh, to get the interest of, of, a, of people. And then, as soon as it became understood that the book was being taken seriously by people like Nick Lemon, it was as if we've got to discredit this guy. 
And that was my first experience with the lengths to which uh, the opposition will go to say the man is a racist or he is uh, a sexist or he makes up data, fudges the data, he's writing uh, at the behest of sinister contributors. It's not enough to... By the way, what I'm saying is as true, I, I think, of the attacks on people writing on the left as is on people writing on the right. But it is not enough to take on the arguments that are in the yeah. book. You've got to demonize the writer. And I think that's one of the most pernicious aspects of current, um, the, the current political debate. I wonder when that, I guess it's always happened. I was going to say, wonder when that really began. But it does seem like the mid-'80s was a particular time of that. I mean, that was 84, your book. Uh, I came to Washington in 85, and Bob Bork was in 87. And there was yeah. just a moment there where somehow I don't know if it's the, the, the left and the know? mainstream culture was sort of losing control and they sensed it and they just had to discredit anyone who challenged certain premises or... or I'll tell you what really struck a nerve with Losing Ground. This, I think, became clear very uh, soon. If you read Losing Ground, I care about poor people. Right. Yeah, that's and, and my argument was not that we were spending too much money. It wasn't that we had welfare queens uh, that were fraudulently getting the money. I, I say it, I think, explicitly in the introduction to the book. Uh, the, the worst thing about uh, uh, policy uh, is that it's hurt the people we've tried to help. And uh, that's the province of the left. I mean, the, we had our assigned roles. People on the right. right are supposed to worry about welfare queens and, and we're spending too much money. And people on the left, yes, the programs may not work as well as they should, but at least they care. And here is this uh, guy on the right pretending that he actually cares about these people, and that struck a nerve. And also, I think, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, you respect, respect, respected the poor people enough to think they behave rationally yeah. in response to incentives. Yeah. I mean, you weren't patronizing them and saying, these people are just brought up in a certain way and you can't expect better. You were making an argument that actually the system was, in a sense, was driving them or driving them, leading them towards these decisions. Yeah, it's ironic because... The system they uh, hadn't set up. The, system uh, the, the, the left started out by saying the system is to blame, so it's not their fault that they're poor and that they're out of work. And in a funny kind of way, I was saying, well, yeah, the system is to blame. Right. The system is to blame for systematically uh, luring them down Primrose Path. And f looking back, what is it now? Almost, well, it's 40 years this year, right? 30, 30 years this 30 year. Years, well, I can't yeah. do math. 30 years. That's why I'm not a statistical <laughs> social scientist. Uh, 30 years this year. So what areas have, has there been the most progress uh, uh, in you know, welfare, crime, education, and in which the least? Is there any lesson, are there lessons to be learned from that? Crime. Crime. Uh, and we go back to Jim Wilson, who had, you can't calibrate exactly how much his influence was, but it's substantial. I mean, think about uh, uh, the huge change in imprisonment policy. I think we probably went too far the other direction, but but we did need to start putting a whole lot of people behind bars where they could no longer victimize people. The whole broken ideas, uh, broken windows uh, philosophy of uh, uh, law enforcement, which took hold because of Jim Wilson's article on, uh, on uh, broken windows. And we've had falling crime rates for a long time. I understand that there continues to be a very sophisticated debate about how much you can attribute to various causal factors. Uh, on the reductions in crime, my way of responding to that is to say, okay, yeah, it's hard to know for sure, but if we were still imprisoning at the rates we were imprisoning in 1980, um, we'd have uh, a million fewer people in uh, prison. If tomorrow we released a million people from prison, what do you think would happen to the crime rate? Uh, right. to, to me, the changes in law uh, enforcement and criminal justice policy were crucial in creating the reduction in crime. I suppose maybe it was easier to get political support for that because an awful lot of middle class people and voters were affected in, by crime. In, including yeah. liberals living on the Upper East Side of New York. Right. Uh, the, yeah. If you look at which kinds of public policies get reformed, in an oddly high proportion of cases, there are reforms that benefit the upper middle class. It's sort of sad. Yeah. The yeah. ones who need yeah. the least help, right? Yeah. Welfare, I mean, you are considered somehow the father or godfather or stepfather or welfare something of, of, of the 1996 welfare reform legislation. Was that, how significant did that turn out to be in your opinion? Or? 
Well, it was hugely instructive. Um, it showed that you don't actually have to do something to get a behavioral response. You just have to announce that you're going to do something. One of the, the welfare rules declined precipitously, which is good. I, I think the Welfare Reform Act was a good thing, uh, even though it wasn't a panacea. But what was fascinating is those rules started to drop as soon as the law was passed. Mm. Before there had been any kind of sanctions or anything else, the left had done such a good job of saying, if this is passed, you know, we'll have Calcutta on the Hudson, a line from our friend Pat Moynihan, uh, and, and you're going to have these dr draconian uh, consequences that a lot of people just left the rolls because there were a whole lot of people that were on the rolls because it was convenient but not because they really needed it that bad. So you've got a huge behavioral response because of a specific policy reform and it would be nice if, uh, if folks had noticed that and said maybe we could extend that to other areas but they didn't really do that. So, yeah. And education would seem to me, looking from the outside, uh, to be well, maybe the, the toughest uh, to get any change in, right? Oh, we had a big change called uh, No Child Left Behind. Uh, you know, I feel guiltiest as far as my career is concerned because when No Child Left Behind was being proposed. This is early Bush 2001, administration. 2001. Yeah. I was deep into a book that would be eventually be called Human Accomplishment. I was just totally locked in on it, barely noticed this. When I finally looked up, and saw that it had been passed, I said, this is the most idiotic bill uh, I've ever heard of. And I, I, I never said that during the debate. Uh, in education, what you have is a series of, I think, terrible reforms, with No Child Left Behind being one of the worst, because of what I consider to be the educational romanticism, which infects left and right alike, which says, oh, all the children can be nuclear physicists if they get the right opportunity. Well, they don't literally say that, but they do literally say in some cases every child can go to college or handle college level material if only they get the right opportunities. I think that this kind of thinking about education has slowed what could be real progress. I think it has punished kids who do not have th that peculiar set of intellectual gifts that make you thrive in college, but do have other gifts that they could. Uh, education policy, I think, has been one of the most poorly handled. Any one or two things, if someone, some presidential candidate called you up and said, what should I make the core of my education reform agenda, what, what would be the... A changeover from, sort of, uh, from uh, the, the college degree as the standard of educational success to certifications. Uh, so give a young person uh, something that he can take to an employer that says what this person knows and what he can do as opposed to how, you know, how long it took him to learn it and where he, and, and where he did it. Uh, the, the CPA, the uh, Certified Public Accountant exam, is a really good example. If you can pass the CPA, that is credible evidence to an employer. You actually know a lot about accounting. And the fact that you got that score because you went to an online university that cost you a few hundred bucks as opposed to University of Virginia or something uh, doesn't make that much difference. Uh, we could extend that to all kinds of things right. which would enable young people to get training uh, that they could take to the marketplace. Doesn't take them four years to do it. Doesn't take them $100,000 in student loans to do it. There are reforms that could be done. I think some of that's beginning to happen just because of the technological possibility yeah. that you think of online education and the pressure of the yeah. what's been called. This is, this is one case where market forces are going to revolutionize education, right. I think, in the next 15 years for the better, and the educational establishment will not be able to withstand it, in large part because uh, college education has gotten so bad except in the hard sciences. I mean, people will still be lining up to send their kids to Harvard and Yale and Princeton no matter what. Right. But to uh, spend a whole lot of money to send your kid to uh, the second tier state university or a private college, no, people won't put up with that much longer. And the ability online to take a class, and take a competency test, and have a discussion with some teaching assistant if you want yeah. to do that, and even physically go sometimes, but not all the time. I think all of that really is, is, is a game. I mean, I'm not normally a believer that technology by itself 
changes things fundamentally. But I think in this case, it really could uh, we break, both, I, break I, it open. I bet we both had the same experience, that we have taught uh, a seminar uh, by a, 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 a TV hookup or something. Yes. It feels very much like being in that seminar yeah. room. And your interactions with those students are the same kinds of interactions you have if you were physically there. And I, the way I think of it is, you know, at the state level, you mentioned UVA, I live in Virginia. If there's a great economics class at the University of Virginia, are you doing these students at the other, I think, 12 other state campuses in Virginia a favor by not allowing them to watch that class, which is probably a lecture class anyway, so it's not as if they're... There's no Q&A that's Right, so why are you not letting them watch the excellent class that's taught at UVA if they're enrolled at a Southern Virginia Community College? rather than making them take a class by someone who may not be nearly as good a professor who's physically there, or at least give them the choice. I just think at, at some point, some governor's going to realize he can save a lot of money. Yeah. Now, there will be huge resistance to this, of course, I suppose. There will be resistance, but it's going to be resistance by the universities themselves, which are under enormous financial pressure. And, of course, now you can have these massive uh, online courses, MOOCs, I think Oops, they're called, right. where you can listen to Sandell at Harvard lecturing on ethical theory or something. Right. Um, if, you, if you stop to think about it, the idea of going to a university and sitting in a lecture course is really one of the worst, worst uses, most inefficient uses of a right. university's uh, assets. And even in the K through 12 environment, again, an excellent where it is probably more important to have a teacher there for, you know, students aren't sort of sitting taking notes, but still, um, you know, excellent. Well, I think we've seen this with some of the Khan Academy and mm -hmm. some of these other things, the ability to do stuff online and uh, partly online, and to break up the monopoly. Also, the really 19th century notion that everyone, or if it is even 19th century, notion that everyone should go at the same pace, mm -hmm. and that all seems it's going to look yeah, crazy. Ed ed education, education is going to be a happy story. Uh, in the past, that's, it has been a miserable story. That's good. That's good to hear. I'm cheered up that you're, 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 you're considered such a pessimist sometimes, or you know, that if you think education is going to be a happy story, I'm, that cheers me up. But I, I actually agree with that, I think. There are some changes that would help, I think, accelerate the process and, and also make sure it's not just taken advantage of by a few people who are able to do so, you know, who are most well situated to do so. But. but a lot of the reforms in education cannot be blocked by the teachers union. They cannot be blocked by the Federal Department of Education. They are going to happen for reasons beyond their control. It's funny, I came to Washington to work at the Education Department. Um, we got to know each other. I had met you before, but really then when I worked for Bill Bennett. And I've often thought that we fought hard for school choice and all kinds of other things, sensible reforms on the whole, I think, and got nowhere, basically. And I've often thought the most important thing we did at, that, at the Education Department, which was done really on the side and almost not quite inadvertently, but very much a sort of afterthought, was we defended the homeschoolers who were beginning to crop up all over the country. And people forget this now, but they were really, um, the states were trying to shut them down in many cases. And we had one person, two people in the general counsel's office who helped some of these local groups defend themselves against efforts to, to shut them down. But Parents were That's a to huge their accomplishment. Kids. Yeah, and in retrospect, well, we didn't do it. We just helped a little bit. In retrospect, I, th I think doing that was probably more important than all the other mm -hmm. stuff we did to try to reform the big bureaucracies, which is sort of a lesson, too, I think, that often the way you change policies is to go around the existing institutions. They're awfully hard to change directly. Exactly. You know, Fred Smith once said this about Federal Express and the post office. You know, conservatives, when he was a kid when I was a kid. You spent a lot of time complaining about the post office, this massive government bureaucracy, uh, unionized, I think, and therefore, you know, very in inefficient, expensive. And everyone kept having post office reform proposals. I think Republicans in Congress, and of course, they went nowhere. And then Fred Smith invented FedEx, you know, and then fax machines and email. And who really worries about you the post really office? You don't really need the post office <laughs> yeah. anymore. And, so, and, you know, a lot of that's going to happen, I think, with, with lots of domains of life. Uh, in some cases, the, bu the, the bureaucracy can fight back, and they can simply maintain a government monopoly, which prevents these kinds of workarounds. But technology is a big help in, the, in this regard. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So you wrote Losing Ground. You survived the attacks on you and uh, all that. And I think it really had a big effect on uh, policies, many policies, but obviously especially welfare policy, contributed in crime. Uh, then what? Then you sort of took a different tack, I think, for your next book in well, pursuit. In Pursuit, not a very good title, but I'm stuck with it. 
In Pursuit uh, was the book I really wanted to write when I left my employment of, from the 1970s at, at a social science research institute. I had gotten fascinated by the idea that, well, it's, this sounds like su such a pedestrian idea, the complete disconnect between uh, your material condition in life and the degree to which you are experienced experiencing lasting and justified satisfaction with life as a whole, which is my working definition of happiness. And how does public policy feed into this? And, and I, I, I had the idea of using as the dependent variable, if I can introduce some jargon, sure. the thing that, that you're exploring as the phenomenon you want to explain, uh, why not use as the dependent variable the degree to which pe people are enabled to pursue happiness? And that's how you judge whether food stamps are a good idea or whether an education reform is a good idea or the rest of it. That's ultimately the template. It was very abstract. Uh, and as I started to work on it, it's almost as if I had to get push aside a whole lot of underbrush to get to that core topic, and that underbrush was losing ground. <laughs> and after losing ground had been written, uh, I was able to focus in on, on this this uh, almost a philosophical disquisition on the relationship of public policy to the ability of people to pursue happiness. And I will say that the result of it was a book that um, got very little attention when it came out, um, but that first remains my own baby. I mean, that's my favorite of all the books I've written. But secondly, if you look at everything I've written subsequently, it goes back to that well. Uh, a lot of the themes in In Pursuit are to be found in the bell curve, what it means to be a libertarian, uh, human accomplishment in our hands, all of them. Uh, so for me, In Pursuit is at the center of everything I've written. And how does putting things in that, in that context, uh, the pursuit of happiness, uh, lasting satisfaction or enjoyment, as opposed to the normal, I don't know, way econo economists might think about or social scientists might think about what Public po what goal public policy should pursue? Yeah. I mean, what difference does it make? Well, suppose you're thinking about something like poverty, and we have a measure of poverty, and so we say X percentage of people are below the poverty line or above the poverty line. You know, what does that really mean? Um, yes, it has some relevance to to uh, your level of material existence and so forth, but we've all known poor people. Uh, low-income people who have lived very happy lives. Uh, they've had families that have been sources of great joy to them. They haven't been rich, but they've never gone hungry. Uh, they've, they've, uh, they've done work that they enjoyed doing. They had self-respect uh, about what they did. They could legitimately take pride in themselves. And we also know other people who've had exactly the same level of income who've lived absolutely miserable lives for a variety of reasons. Well, it's important, let me back off and, and say, I'm not saying that level of material resources is unimportant. Right. I am saying that we ought to be focusing on the difference between those two examples I just gave and said, why is it that life has been so successful and that life has been so unsuccessful for reasons unrelated uh, to economics? And so that leads you to ask a whole new series of questions uh, that you wouldn't ask if, if that weren't your, your dependent variable. And those questions, I, mean, one, I can imagine someone saying, well, those are interesting questions. And if one were writing a grand psychology of human beings, they'd be uh, certainly fascinating to explore. But how do they affect public policy? Well, the, the, the framework that I, I chose to uh, analyze it is Abraham Maslow's needs hierarchy. Abraham Maslow being a psychologist from the 1940s and his needs hierarchy became quite well known. And he started out by saying man does not live, uh, does live by bread alone if there is no bread. So first you've got to have physical survival uh, and you've got to deal with that. And as soon as you've dealt with that, then things like safety come into play. You know, you've got to be safe from a leopard jumping out of the tree at night. Uh, and after you have, have dealt with that, then you can uh, successively move up to uh, other needs being uh, filled, such as dignity and self-respect, and ending with uh, the thing which we talk about all the time now, self-fulfillment. 
Uh, so you talk about those as the enabling conditions for the pursuit of happiness. You can't pursue happiness if you're starving. You can't pursue happiness if you are totally under threat all the time, etc. But what you then say is, well, how do they interact? So that if self-respect is also a deep human need, how does that interact with the way you acquire the food and shelter and the rest of it? If there is an interaction, it has public policy implications as to how you enable people to satisfy their material needs but also maintain their self-respect. And you're starting to get into some fairly obvious implications that, you know what, just handing out the food and shelter is impeding the self-respect big time. And that's an important public policy implication. So I'm just giving you one example of things that I've worked through. No, that's interesting to me because I'm not actually a libertarian, I don't think, but you are more or less, or yeah, say yeah. you are. Um, but actually I would say that's contrary, isn't it, to a lot of libertarians who don't like this notion in a way of focusing on happiness because it, they might say what, that you, what you just said would imply the government should start to getting in the business of, well, if we can kind of judge this hierarchy of needs and judge people's happiness, let's by all means adjust public policies to make people happier and you're sort of on a very slippery slope away from arguably a kind of limited yeah. government to, uh, you know, nudging people in certain directions and... Nudging is a very big word these days. Yes, so. right. Yeah, and, and I spend a lot of the book pointing out how that, te that tends to backfire. The government is not in a position, because the government, the, the way I put it in the book is, whenever the government says, well, here is this problem, such as poverty or not enough housing or this, that, or the other thing, that we've got to solve and we will take care of that, in some sense they are taking some of the trouble out of life as, as they look at it. But from another perspective, they're also draining some of the life from life because the stuff of life consists of, of, of coping with the problems around us. They can't be insuperable and manageable problems or we get miserable, but we have to cope. So I, I go to, a, a, you know, preserving my libertarian credentials, mm -hmm. I think I, I work very hard saying actually um, the government is inherently problematic when it tries to get into that the kind of thing. However, let me point out that at the end of uh, In Pursuit, I say, look, uh, Adam Smith could admire and be a friend with Edmund Burke and vice versa. And uh, that's the way I look at it. I am a Smithian, but I'm not only a Smithian who loves wealth of nations, I even, I love theory of moral sentiments even more. And you put those two together, and for me, uh, I will use the modern term libertarian to describe what that produces, but I'm not hung up on the word. To me, Adam Smith had a, a profoundly correct view of how human society should work. I think that's important. I hadn't really thought about it this way before, but you know, you, you're able to both make the case for a limited government without signing on to what some modern libertarians, and certainly economists in a way, sign on to, which is a kind of we don't have a foggiest idea what's right and wrong or what makes people happy or not. Therefore, we just should stay out of the way and let people do whatever they want. I mean, it sounds like you well, have a, I mean, like Smith, you sort of have a practical argument for the market and for limiting government without necessarily a you know, full relativistic or a sort of yeah. uh, account of... When, when they say we ought to leave them alone, you've got to really leave them alone so that, for example, uh, you, you, you could legalize drugs, in my view, in a libertarian world where people were responsible for the consequences of their action, and if they were drugged up and unable to hold a job, that was going to really pretty much uh, uh, make taking drugs really painful. You can't have legalization of drugs if you have a welfare state that steps in and so forth. I, I sometimes make the case that in a libertarian world, uh, People are absolutely free in their uh, intimate relations to cohabit with each other or marry each other or have serial girlfriends and boyfriends. They can do whatever they want. But guess what? In a libertarian world, the nuclear family is going to be incredibly strong. Because in a libertarian world, women and men uh, have huge incentives to want to form family units just because they're economically viable, especially from the woman's point of view, she's going to have children in a way that a variety of other alternatives aren't. So to me there is an underlying paradox. The, the United States in the 19th century was pretty much as close to a libertarian state as we're going to see 
and the family was incredibly strong. Social pressures were incredibly strong. There were all sorts of ways in which uh, the civic culture was inc incredibly vital. Those weren't abnormalities, those were the results to me of freedom. Yeah, I suppose you could argue, and maybe you, you could talk about your most recent book in this context, Coming Apart, that now you, in some parts of the country, at least you have the worst of both worlds, which is a paternalistic state that protects people from the consequences of their decisions in a way, mm -hmm. but also a kind of libertarian ethos in terms of the family and yeah. so forth that allows people to be foolish, um, impulsive, whatever you want to say, in the short term, and one ends up with... You know, what, what yes. You know, um, and, and a lot of the blame for that uh, goes to, I think, the elites. I think the elites have fallen down on the job. Um, you aren't nearly as old as I am, but even you can perhaps remember back to a time uh, when, for example, it was considered unseemly to build a 25,000 square foot house even though you could afford it, uh, that that was getting too big for your britches. That was sort of, you know, putting a, you know, in your face toward right. people who did not have as much. And uh, the whole sense of unseemliness has, has died. A lot of the ways in which the elites formally set the standard and also were supposed to live up to that standard, those have been lost. Um, yeah, I'm just basically saying, you're right. We now have an ethos which refuses to say, here are virtuous ways of living that, that uh, ought to be applauded and celebrated. And instead, we're all saying, oh, we're non-judgmental. We're abdicating a very important responsibility. But what's interesting, one of the interesting things about Coming Apart, which was published, what, a year and a half? Two, two years ago, yeah. T 2012, something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that somehow the elites, having said all this, have, t have managed to save themselves or from the consequences of what they uh, what they profess. Isn't it interesting the baby boomers have managed to make the world work for them in every conceivable way while neglecting their obligations to the rest of it. Yeah, in terms of marriage uh, and uh, working hard uh, and for that matter oftentimes being deeply engaged in communities and even religion. The, the elites um, are behaving pretty well within their own communities but they are incre so, so increasingly segregated from the rest of America that it's uh, almost, uh, I'm doing okay, Jack, and, and so you guys can take care of yourselves. Um, yeah, it's a nice time to be a member of the American elite um, if you don't worry too hard about the rest of the country. And the argument of the book was that the increasing gap between especially what the top 20% and the bottom 30, uh, is that the... Um, well, you have, you have two different kinds of, uh, of contrast. The upper middle class is a pr pretty big group. That's about 20%. And if you compare them with the working class, which is about the bottom 25, 30%, the, a big gap has opened up there. But the real problem, I think, lies in the people around the country, which is a much smaller percentage of the population. People who have national influence on the culture or the economy, uh, or the politics, they tend to, well, we are talking in Washington, D.C. And if you move west and north from where we are sitting, you have one of the most intense concentrations of great affluence and great power and education at elite universities that you will find anywhere in the country, which means anywhere in the world. And uh, the, the, this, this, uh, this area that I'm talking about is big enough that kids can be raised in it and live their lives in it with very seldom moving out of it into any other world. And then they go on to their elite colleges and then they go on to their nice professions. And the country is increasingly being run by people who, if you sat them down in Topeka, Kansas, would feel like they were in a foreign country. And your account of at least the bottom half, third, I'm not sure, of Topeka, Kansas, and almost mm -hmm. everywhere else, was pretty grim. I mean, that, that certainly got a lot of attention when the book was published. Um, just the degree yeah. of family decomposition and, and, and social and, decomposition. And one of the reasons was that I limited the uh, data to whites, non-Latino whites. Because a lot of times you can take a look at these social problems and say, well, they're very bad, 
And of course, they're concentrated in the African American community or Latinos or something. And by looking just at whites, uh, it, it concentrated our attention. And also, there are just too many people who now know what small town America is like. Now, I grew up in Iowa, a town of 15,000. We didn't have a meth crisis in, in small towns then. You now have you now have the problems of the inner city which have in many ways spread into a much broader range of American communities. And since the book has come out and there's been a ton of literature about it, friendly, unfriendly, or just some of it in between, I guess. Yeah, I, Any, I have you learned I mean anything are you more convinced that things are dire or you, do you think you overdid the I mean, that's what struck me the most reading the book and teaching the book actually at the Hertog program for, for a very interesting three-hour discussion. I would say the students were willing to believe the elite side, A, that they're doing well, weirdly somewhat contrary to their own doctrines, they're living much more responsible, socially integrated, traditional yeah. lives, and B, that they're totally out of touch with the rest of America. You have that quiz where you ask people mm -hmm. if they know anyone in certain uh, walks of life or watch certain, seen certain movies, et cetera, and it is pretty startling, the gulf. But they really balked, I would say, and these, of course, mostly are upper middle class kids, at what they took to be your excessively dark picture of what's going on, not just in the bottom five or ten percent, but really in a pretty good chunk of, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, as you say, of white America. Um, well, you know, has any of the data I, I actually, been challenged? Interestingly, in I, your I, view, I, or? I live in uh, that America. I live out in uh, the western part of Maryland in a small town. It's a blue-collar and, and uh, agricultural community. Uh, there's a, a working-class community that my kids went to school in. And there are, you know, it's a good news, bad news thing. The good news is those communities are still filled with really good people and people that are resourceful and deal with their problems. Um, but we also see in, in, in that same community we see parents whose daughters, much to their chagrin, have had a child uh, without getting married. Uh, we have seen increases in drug use. Parents are having lots of problems with their kids that were unheard of 30 years ago in such communities or 20 years ago. And so are they still good places to live? The particular towns, where, town where I live and the, the adjacent towns, the answer is yes. Are there also, just at looking at it, do we know that there are problems that are growing and that are going to threaten those communities' ability to function in the future? Yes, we also know that. So um, if you say, was I too dire? I might have been too dire in some cases about how much deterioration has occurred already. I wasn't being too dire about the degree to which we are on a trajectory where we know what the consequences will be. I suppose your most controversial book was The Bell Curve, published in, when was that, 1994. How did you come to write it? What was, maybe you should say a word about what it argued, um, and then what the reaction was. Well, how I came to write it first. Uh, in 1986, I got an invitation to be on a panel commenting on two papers that were to be presented at the American Psychological Association. And one of them purported to explain uh, differences in crime by using IQ, and the other one purported to explain uh, differences in unemployment using IQ. And my first reaction was, but don't we know that IQ tests are biased and they don't really measure anything? And uh, then I read the, Bibli the, the papers, and I also saw the bibliographies, and I realized there was a literature out there that was extremely sophisticated, rigorous, and that nobody was talking about. And I got interested in IQ hmm. and its relationship to social problems. And by 1989, I had decided I was going to write a book about it. But then Dick Hernstein, the professor at Harvard, who had written on IQ in the past, had an article in the Atlantic Monthly, which led me to think, ah, Ernstein's already doing this. So I called him up. I'd met him before. We'd, we'd been friendly. And uh, I said, if you're doing a book on, on this, I'm not going to try to compete with you. And Dick said to me, no, I'm not. And he paused, and he said, why don't we do it together? Oh, right, right. And I paused, and I said, let me think about that. And I called him back later that afternoon and said, let's do it. 
that was the entire. So it was his idea. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, it was. It was. It, that was the extent of our negotiations. Wow. You know? And it was. I will say parenthetically, uh, he just became a dear, dear friend. It was a wonderful collaboration. Um, so anyway, we did this book. And what is it about? Very simple. It was said in the subtitle: "Intelligence and Class Structure in American Life." And we were saying IQ interacts with all these important phenomena, whether it's crime or poverty or single parenthood or a variety of other things. And uh, this has effects on the social structure because we live in a world which is increasingly hospitable to people with high IQs and increasingly difficult for people with low IQs. It turns out that in order to write such a book, you have to confront the issue of race. Because uh, in, in the bell curve, as in Coming Apart, we had some chapters that were exclusively using white data uh, samples to say, look, the, the relationship has nothing to do with uh, uh, race issues there. But if you want to extend the argument to the whole country, you've got to say, well, can you interpret IQ scores uh, for people of different ethnicities? So we had chapter 13 was uh, ethnic differences in IQ. That's what created the firestorm. So the book comes out, and um, there's actually a, a rather nice review of it in the New York Times. Hmm. There was a uh, very collegial panel we had at the American Enterprise Institute with scholars from the left and right treating it as a serious work. And then it hit the fan. Uh, it's, it's hard to recreate now the degree to which that book was just at the center of conversation. I remember, I think it was two or three months after the book came out, I had given up reading the newspaper. Catherine, my wife, uh, was in charge of reading everything and telling me if I had to respond to something. And she reported th three months after the book came out that that morning's Washington Post had two op-eds and two news stories that all referenced the bell curve in one way or another. And it was like that all the time. And the accusations leveled against us were hideous. I mean, uh, they, the reaction to uh, uh, losing ground was nothing as compared to the bell curve. I was in shell, sh I was shell shocked for months. And then what? I mean, basically, does anyone challenge the basic data today? <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they uh, well, well, the argument of the book, I take it, as I recall, was you couldn't make sensible public policy for, a con for the country without understanding that the objects, or what the right term is, the people who, upon whom these policies would be having an effect are very different in IQ, among other differences. That, that's right. And, and that, therefore, you can't just assume everyone is the same and has 110 or 100 or 120 right. IQ, or probably in the case of the policymakers, a high IQ, because that's what they think, you know, they think everyone's like them. Well, well you know, a lot of, in a lot of ways, uh, we were making arguments that prefigured uh, what I said in Coming Apart. Yeah. In fact, uh, the, the bell curve was very widely talked about, but very little read. So I was able to recycle a lot of material from the bell curve and coming apart, and nobody ever noticed. Uh, we, there was re re relatively little argument about the thesis of the book. It, I don't want to say all, but 95% was about race. And 95% of the argument. Of the argument. But rather little about little the book. book. Yeah, it was, it was about race. And what really struck me, standing back from it now, is that if, if you ask people of our generation, your generation, my generation, what was the bell curve about, what they will say is, oh, wasn't that the book that tried to prove that blacks were genetically inferior to whites? And if you go to the discussion of race, you will see in italics sometimes uh, statements about we don't know what the, what the reasons for ethnic differences in IQ are, we are agnostic about the sources of those, uh, that people get way too excited about the idea of genetic differences. I would go back during the height of the storm and reread the, the, the race chapter to say, you know, how could we have written it better? And I continue to think to that day, it's beautifully written. People, I decided it was like a Rorschach test. People were projecting onto that text their own anxieties. And so they would say, this is an angry book. It is the most unangry book you've ever read. Right. Um, it, it is a polemical book. <laughs> it's, it was, we, we made it almost 
deliberately boring in some cases. We, 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 you know, here is, here is um, for me the most telling factoid about the uh, criticism of the bell curve. You will never, ever find a direct quote from the book. Right. Um, because we actually wrote it saying we want this each sentence to be such that you can't just lift it out of context. They never quote the book. Yeah. It's really something, quite an experience. I do not recommend it. Oh, I'll try to avoid it. Um, that was a good book. <laughs> and I do think it had real policy implications, no, in terms of the education system and other th oh, ways yeah. in which we're not being serious about, we're not doing <sighs> things that would benefit, especially I think the book, yeah. as you said, about, coming, about losing ground. In a way, your main object, maybe this is why people hated it also, your concern was not for the high AQ people who you thought, I think, were doing okay in America. Mm -hmm. It was more that policies were not uh, thinking about the fact that a certain number of the people affected were not very high. Again. Exactly. That, that we were having a society which was, is designed to uh, be an affirmative action employment program for attorneys. Uh, we, we are in all sorts of ways creating a very complex society that, uh, and with complex ethical rules and standards, which is just fine for th those of us overeducated people who love all complexity and subtlety and all that, and makes it much harder to live a life if you are a person who doesn't have that peculiar skill set. A, a friend of mine, uh, actually Ed Crane, who was formerly president of the Cato Institute, he said what you're really saying in terms of people living moral lives is that uh, uh, that everyone has a moral compass, but some are more susceptible to magnetic storms than others. And that was actually a, a nice notion. It's really easy to make that moral compass whiz around if you create the kind of society we are. So, yeah, that was the focus of our concern in the book. It became what I think of as a stealth book, because a after four or five years you saw increasing references to the kind of cognitive stratification that we were talking about. They never called it that. It was always linked to education as opposed to IQ, but a whole lot of the propositions of the book entered the public dialogue. They never referenced the bell curve, um, never mentioned IQ. And now you find liberals worrying, and not without reason, certainly, about, you know, if, if very if high status people marry other high status people, or low status people marry low status people. Uh, that's going to increase social the difference between classes and decrease mobility yeah. among classes. But as Gee, long we as did say that a while ago, didn't yeah. we? <laughs> I guess as long as you say the word status or educational achievement yeah. or yeah. something like that and don't actually suggest that it could partly be IQ, you're okay, sort of. Okay. <sighs> yeah, you're, you're okay, sort of, and especially if you manage to frame it so that race does not enter into the discussion whatsoever. Uh, I've, I've I did develop a real contempt for a lot of academia. I know too many people who are quite famous in academia who said to me privately, it's a wonderful book, and uh, whenever they were asked to comment it pub on publicly, they would trash it without a second thought. It happened in this really interesting number of cases Is that right? with some names that would be very interesting to you if I revealed them, but I won't. It's very gentlemanly of you, though it's unfortunate, of course. But so often, being a gentleman is contrary to actually, you know. I don't. I don't, want, I don't want to reopen those fights. Yeah, anymore. I guess not. And so that preoccupied you for a little while, I suppose. But you moved right on, actually, and um, didn't didn't uh, dwell on that. I dwelled on it for a while. Did you? Um, now Dick Hernstein died. Dick Hernstein fairly Stein soon died after. Uh, just a few weeks before the first bound copies came out. Is that right? I didn't realize he died before it came out. He was he was diagnosed with terminal cancer on the same day we sent in the very final bit of draft for copy editing, and uh, and he died yeah. just a few months later, and and so partly I was grieving at the loss of a dear friend, and part of me was saying you know if if Dick were still alive we could call each other on the phone. And said, right. did you see what this idiot said? And, and we would have had that kind of, of, uh, of, of mutual support. So uh, I think it's probably true that I was clinically depressed for uh, some time after the bell curve came out. And um, okay, I will, I will admit it. The piece of writing I think I'm proudest of uh, is the afterword I wrote to the bell curve for the paperback edition because uh, I, I think if you read it, it will sound 
extremely cool, extremely detached, slightly amused. Mm -hmm. That was a complete misrepresentation of my state of mind, but that I managed to pull off That's good. that that voice uh, is a source of real satisfaction. And that was within presumably about that a year. That was within a, a year. few months. Yeah, the, the, that came out uh, in June, and uh, or I was done writing it in June, and the book had come out in October, so it was pretty soon after the. Wow. Yeah. And do people? I'm just. I don't know if you follow it even, but I mean, do people in you know, campus today or in social science environments today? They just don't talk about it. I mean, they don't. Sus they can't sustain the assault because what's the basis of it at this point? There's no, uh, no, no one's done anything to disprove. I mean, there were some. I remember word books published of oh, essays about it. There was it a cottage industry in such books, but no one disproved anything, no, right? No, and and in fact, uh, the the, the uh, see see Dick and I deliberately did not push the envelope on any of our claims. We really pulled our punches with some things which we could have stated more strongly. So it's not that we were prescient about what the state of the knowledge was. We were very cautious. And so essentially, the substance of bell curve is part of the conventional wisdom now. It's just not put in Isn't terms of funny? IQ. Yeah. It's always put in terms of educational attainment. And from a policy point of view, assuming it's not a good thing for a society to be increasingly diverging, if it is, and increasingly lacking contact and I, between these two, roughly, you know, two different yeah. parts and, and mobility from one to the other, assuming that's the case. Is there much to be done about it? I guess maybe, is there a fatalism implied in the bell curve, or is that not uh, fair? Well, when I revisited that in, in Coming Apart, because a lot of the th this material overlaps, I try to say to people who are in the privileged elites, to what extent are you living in an environment which is not nearly as rich as it could be in terms of, of your human life? Um, and, and to what extent are you systematically depriving your children of some of the experiences that made you who you are? Um, and the good news is that I get, when I say that to an audience of, of older people, I see a lot of heads nodding, very affluent people who done everything they possibly can for their children and sort of saying, my children have, have missed out on a lot that I had. I also try to point out, you know what? You can live in a small town like I do, 60 miles out of Washington, and you really aren't losing anything. The internet and the rest of it means you have access to, to all sorts of stuff that you formerly had to come to the big city for. When I do want to come to the big city, it's an hour and a half away, big deal. Uh, you, you, you don't have to live in McLean. You, you don't have to uh, live in these enclaves of, of the cognitive elite, and your life will be the better for it. I also, uh, this will sound facetious, but it's not, I regularly play poker at a casino in Charlestown, West Virginia, which is a microcosm of uh, the real America. And I'll be sitting there at a table with all kinds of people, every ethnicity, every socioeconomic group, every kind of profession or non-profession. And uh, that kind of experience just constantly reinforces to me that not all the interesting people in this country have gone to Harvard, and they don't all live in McLean. Uh, there are really interesting, funny, engaging people out there, and you shouldn't pull away from them. They're, Americans are a marvelous set of people. And from a policy point of view, Apart from encouraging people to live in Burkittsville, not McLean, is there any uh, anything to be done? You know what? We need job owning. Um, one of the uh, critical comments of the book by a libertarian writer actually was that Murray offers little more than plaintive moralizing uh, because I don't offer policy solutions. Well, plaintive moralizing has a lot to be said for it, and a lot of the ways in which America has changed its ways had its origins in just saying to people, this is, this is not the best way to do things. The Civil Rights Movement is a classic example. The Great Awakenings, Religious Awakenings we've had, are examples. And if, if I'm correct that life is truly richer if you're more deeply engaged with a variety of people around you, if you're more deeply engaged in your community and so forth, if I'm correct in that, it ought to be an idea that has resonance. And if it has resonance, it could very easily be picked up. So, so I consider my uh, role in life now much more jawboning than saying, here's, here's a plan with uh, six points that will solve the problem. Though I do think, don't you think, that things like 
I mean, take the public school system and uh, the fact that it's, which I'm not against, that it's locally controlled or regionally controlled and but therefore the kids in Fairfax County go to very good public schools, pretty good public schools, and the kids in somewhere else, less of that, less, uh, less well-off place, go to worse public schools. There are certain ways in which just, just basic public policies probably reinforce the stratification where other policies might not. I don't know. I mean, I, uh, well, education is, is one of those things which is, uh, drives the, the segregation because parents want to send their kids to good right. schools. And here is where <laughs> the empirical record made me feel comfortable about sending my kids to a mediocre public school, but the, uh, it was a safe public school. It was a nurturing public school, but it wasn't terrific. The fact is that um, so much of the kids' intellectual and academic achievement occurs because of things in the home that, that you are not, y your kids are not, not going to lose 10 IQ points because they went to a mediocre public school. And on the contrary, uh, my daughter, who went to Middlebury uh, from this mediocre public school, and I, who went to Harvard from a mediocre public school in Iowa, both had the same experience. We were, uh, in, in, uh, when we went as freshmen, we were around a lot of other people who had been in Exeter or Andover or very fancy schools. And, you know, they were sort of blasé about all this. And uh, my daughter and I, when we were freshmen, were on a huge high. Uh, and we were so excited to be out in the real world. Did we know a little bit less because of our, our indifferent education? Yeah. And we also caught up, in, you know, in a year at college. So, so I'm saying to the, any parents who are listening, go ahead and send your kids to a, a school as long as it's safe and nurturing and don't worry too much about whether it's you know, the best public school you've ever seen. It's okay. Safe is, of course, something that's not the case, and nurturing in exactly some of the right. inner cities. Exactly right. there you really I, would never, I would never have sent my children to uh, a lot of the D.C. public schools. Yeah. And it's terrible that we can sign these parents in D.C. to send them to these exactly schools. Exactly right. That is really So I'm a big school choice advocate. Uh, um, so the bell curve is respected without being acknowledged. I guess these days. Um, I would like to think it's respected. I'm not even sure of that. Well, or it's, but it, but it's it, lessons. It, it has been, worked its way into yes, the Yes, I'm struck by how much that's the case, yeah. too, yeah. Um, other books, anything else you've done that somehow is having a comeback or something surprising to you? In yeah, terms of I've, I, may, uh, I may have a book whose time has come. Uh, it was called In Our Hands. Yeah, came out about 10 years ago. It argues for a basic guaranteed income for everybody age 21 and older that replaces the entire welfare state. Replaces all transfer payments, actually, including Social Security and Medicare. Uh, and I like to think it's a, it's a well-argued book where I anticipate the problems and talk about how they can be avoided. And uh, I'm beginning to see references to a basic uh, guaranteed income and references specifically to the book as a way out of this hole we're digging ourselves into uh, fiscally that we will not be able to avoid mm -hmm. forever. So that's one bit of good news about uh, a book that's making a comeback. However, Bill, I'll have to tell you that the book that I have been associated with that will still be read 500 or 1,000 years from now is a book about the Apollo program that my wife and I did right, uh, together back in the late 1980s. It's a story of how we got to the moon, focusing on the people on the ground, and it essentially is a unique source book. And so my prediction is a thousand years from now, World War II will be a very, you know, yeah. obscure thing. Uh, nothing that happened in the 20th century will still be talked about much, except that was when we first left Earth. And there will still be people who will consult our book Apollo uh, for, for original source material. That's the one that will last. That's good to know. Now, are you depressed? Since I hadn't expected to talk about space, but I'm actually personally somewhat interested in this. Are you depressed by the fact that we seem to have managed to literally have regressed in our space efforts since 72? Regressed, regressed a lot. I mean, has there ever been a case in human history where you would have, and sometimes there's some things stall out, but to actually, we could not do, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, right, oh. what we did in 1972 or 1969. Uh, we, we were able to put into Earth orbit at that time a uh, tonnage that would be way beyond. Uh, it, it stopped so fast that we had uh, two fully built uh, Saturn V vehicles with their spacecraft 
you know, ready to go except for putting the gas in them uh, that we never used. It, it is, it is uh, very, very sad. The, the good news here is I think eventually it's going to be private money that right. resuscitates that. And one of, the, one of the good things about the huge private wealth is that when it's somebody like Jeff Bezos, uh, the head of Amazon who has it, who is a big space nut, uh, that a lot of that money is going to be spent, I think probably getting us back into space again, and in, a, and, and in a way in which it can be sustained because there are economic benefits to it. So strategically, I'm optimistic, but looking at the way we threw away the legacy of Apollo is very depressing. Yeah, no, it strikes me as so unusual for a country th that has no external crisis, not as if we were going bankrupt or were invaded by someone. We were wealthier today than we were when we did Apollo, and, and we uh, just shut it down. And then I think the space shuttle, I assume, was a terrible mistake, and uh, we ended up diverting, they, well, was, diverting the whole program to a, you know, yeah. uh, going back and forth to a space station. I mean, it's... Uh, it, it was... Uh, emblematic of the times. Right. That was when we were getting out of Vietnam. It was, uh, it was a time in American history when there was very little vision and there was also, frankly, very little nerve. Right. It would be interesting if the private sector could save us. I suppose that's happened in history, though. A lot of the exploration, the discoveries were, some were government financed, yeah. but a lot were private, or at least partly private, certainly. Uh, uh, if you ask me what is one of the great underestimated forces for what's going to happen to American life in the future, it is the size of the private wealth that can do things now uh, that are mammoth in size. So Bill Gates Foundation can say we're going to get rid of polio worldwide. We are going to do such and such a thing. And I talk to people who are in the field who see how that foundation's money is spent. And they say this is not your run-of-the-mill NGO or government program. This one actually works. So, you know, um, this great public wealth, a uh, private wealth, may be able to solve problems that governments can't. On that hopeful note, we should we should stop. And thank you very much for taking the time. Charles. This has been great fun. Thank Thanks you so much. And thank you for joining us in conversations.